How you doing? Thank you so much for joining me because I know this time you're Yeah, sorry. I was trying. Yeah, thanks. I was trying to get there in the studio. This is my third media interview this evening. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, well, J Juneteenth is a contraction of uh, June 19th and commemorates June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, when um, enslaved Africans in Galveston got the word that um they were they they were um going to be set free okay it's enforcing general order number three uh major general gordon granger rides into galveston texas the day before uh on june 18th june 19th he delivers general order number three and it's enforcing the emancipation proclamation and it's letting people of texas and enslaved africans there in texas know that uh the civil war is over with okay now the there's about two hundred fifty thousand enslaved africans there in uh in in uh texas in general just in texas alone at that time yes yeah, about two hundred fifty thousand in, in the state of texas yeah um and then uh all of them did not learn on june 19th that they were free june 19th became the date that is celebrated of uh uh enslaved africans in texas learning that they were free or in galveston specifically because it takes major general gordon granger and he, he goes in with about two thousand union troops mostly colored troops mostly african-american men and they go throughout the state of texas for almost a year to physically take back control of Texas um, and bring it back into the union. It takes physical force to do this, okay? So we know that April 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrenders to uh, General Ulysses S. Grant at uh, Appomattox Courthouse, Courthouse in Virginia. And this is looked at, at the as the end uh, for all intents and purposes of the civil war all right now there's going to be celebrations that take place in in uh in galveston texas okay uh june 19th and and afterwards and they start commemorating that celebration each year and it's going to start in the celebration start in texas but as african americans move out of the state of texas and move into other states especially during the great migration which is 1915 to 1970 we start seeing the celebration of juneteenth spread throughout the country um and then we know that in 2021 june of 2021 uh the the bill to make juneteenth a federal holiday passed the u.s house of representatives passed the u.s senate and was signed into law by uh, President Joe Biden, so it's become a federal holiday. So it's important for us to correct the history of Juneteenth and protect the history of Juneteenth and use uh, the Juneteenth federal holiday as a tool to force into the national conversation a history that many Republican state legislatures are passing laws to suppress the teaching of that history in their k-12 schools especially in the state of texas yes. and the state of florida well those are two confederate states and you're going to see this happen uh in those former confederate states these are states that seceded from the union starting with south carolina december 20th 1860 about six weeks after abraham lincoln became president-elect and south carolina secedes from the union and other subsequent states you know georgia alabama mississippi 
Texas because they think Lincoln is going to free the enslaved Africans. All right. And we know that the U.S. Civil War starts April 12, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Now, um, it was not Juneteenth was not the last day of slavery, number one, because you're going to have some slave owners in Texas who keep their enslaved Africans for another year. Uh, is believed so they could get another year's worth of crops uh, from them, number one. Number two, we also know when we look at the what are known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, Seminole Indians, some of them are going to keep their enslaved Africans to 1866, 1867, okay? And we know we have the Black Freedom and Indian Treaties of 1866 where those enslaved Africans, other Native American nations are going to get some type of compensation. They're, they're going to get land. They're going to get membership in these Native American nations. And then so when we look at the history uh, of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we know that June 1st has been made as a national day of remembrance of the Tulsa race massacre. OK, so we have all this going on in June. We have June is Black Music Month. We have juneteenth federal holiday and june 1st is the national day of remembrance of the tulsa race massacre we know that tulsa oklahoma was founded by creek indians in about 1834 who got pushed off their land in southeastern united states because of that indian removal act uh signed in, in 1830 signed in law by president andrew jackson and the uh choctaw chickasaw creek cherokee and seminole indians they get moved off their land in southeastern United States. They get forced over a thousand miles into Oklahoma, what's known as the Trail of Tears. And about a third mm -hmm. of the people on the Trail of Tears were their enslaved Africans, were, were, were their African slaves. And they're going to take them into uh, Oklahoma and also into Tulsa, Oklahoma. OK, so when we deal with the uh, history of Juneteenth, it connects us. To Tulsa's history, it connects us to the history of Reconstruction, which that which is that period of 1865 to 1877 in this country, and then it also ties into the Jim Crow era, and it ties into the fight for repairing the damage of a legacy mm -hmm. of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and redlining and racism, systemic racism, etc. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask you a question, uh, Michael. Yes. And we're talking with Michael Amhotep. Uh, he's a African history historian, I want to, want to ask you, yeah. do you think that, you know, Juneteenth will just become another national holiday like um, Martin Luther King Day, where people just look at it as a day to take off work or stay home and children don't go to school, but they don't do anything to commemorate the actual holiday. It's just another day off. Well, that would be so unfortunate. Well, and that's what's happened with, in many instances with Martin Luther King holiday. Well, that's because we most of us really haven't studied the history of Dr. King and we let other people co-opt Dr. King's history. Dr. King was a revolutionary. Um, Dr. Uh, we have to read Dr. King wrote five books. We have to read Dr. King's books and, to, and toward the end of both of their lives, Dr. King and Malcolm X's ideologies were converging. OK, Dr. King uh, was, was leading a, a poor people's campaign and he was calling for yes. economic justice not just for African-Americans, but for all poor people uh, in this country. And also, uh, you know, if you uh, read, so uh, Dr. King gets reduced down to the I Have a Dream speech. But when you study the history of that speech, uh, August 28, 1963, the original name of the speech was called Normalcy Never Again. Then the speech was called a canceled check. The speech was not about yeah. a dream. It's going to be years later that uh, the speech is about a dream. And he's talking about dismantling white supremacy in that speech. The beloved community is what happens after you dismantle white supremacy and racism. OK, so it, 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 whether or not Juneteenth just becomes a day off from work and the day to have a barbecue or not is largely up to African-Americans. Power is the ability to define and shape a reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. So to be able to use Juneteenth as a as a proper tool to help educate America on history, because Americans are very ignorant of history. We have to understand that history first and we have to control that narrative. We cannot we cannot 
leave Juneteenth up to other people to co-opt and shape it into what they want it to be? Well, we're ignorant about history because we were never taught proper history. Uh, the people that have taught all of us in schools uh, across this nation have um, eliminated much of what they did not want people to know. So when you're a kid, you know, you believe whatever they tell you, and uh, hopefully we're, we're a lot smarter than that now. And we have to educate ourselves. We have to research. We have to do what you do. Most of us will never know as much as you know about uh, African history and African-American history, but we need to get started. And there are books that people can read, and I know you've, you know, if people go to your website, yeah. uh, they can, the they can uh, buy your, 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 your CDs. Um, and all of that. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about, you know, your passion for what you do, why you do it, and how we, so many of us, are learning from you. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Stay tuned to Mind Your Business with Charlene. How's everybody doing? Stand by. Okay, back in four minutes, I'm on Charlene Mitchell's show. Uh, mind your business. Stand by, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Stand by. <coughs> okay, I'll be speaking um, at some Juneteenth events. Uh, and I'm, I'm posting them on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. The African History Network. Stand by. All right, you can support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. Back from breaking one minute. Back for breaking one minute. Uh, for the uh the golf update right that's fine yeah i got the email yeah 
Oh, okay. Kevin Cole. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I forget and it popped on. I'm like, oh, I forgot to say it. Right. But anyway, we were talking about, you know, will Juneteenth just become another, you know, day off work, um, you know, kids are out of school. At least we know on uh, Martin Luther King holiday there are marches, there's different, you know, all kinds of different activities. And I guess there are many, many activities on Juneteenth as well. What are some of the traditions that you believe are appropriate? For Juneteenth, uh, some of the traditions. Well, you, you have uh, Juneteenth parades. Um, you have um, you, you'll have um, uh, lectures. You'll have cultural events that uh, teach about the history of Juneteenth. Um, you will have things like uh, music festivals. Um, historically, you would have um uh different games that people would play uh it, it became something it became something that was festive okay and uh -huh. one of the reasons why it became something that was festive was because when you read slave narratives about when they got the word that they were free they celebrated okay it was it was a happy time now some of them like felix haywood some of them thought he said we thought we were going to become uh as as uh, rich as white people uh, or in some cases richer than white people and he said you know they were soon disappointed he said because we we were the ones who had the skills okay uh, right he, right he, he lived in texas and he originally came he was born in north carolina um and he was uh he lived in texas in san antonio texas and um he said you know when they got the word uh that they were free you know they thought that they were going to you know going to be rich okay so because it's important to understand there were at least 262 skills trades and crafts that african people had in this country from 1619 to 1865 and these are skills trades and crafts that that, that built the country we were blacksmiths and coppersmiths and engineers and, and basket makers barbers uh bartenders uh we're working with horses we're working with animals we're uh tending everything to that was needed we knew how to do everything agriculture everything right uh so it's so it, it's important to in addition to the cookouts in addition to uh touring museums and things like this to really teach this history about this period of time but then also what happens after slavery ends talk about the reconstruction era and it, uh some advancements that african americans were making 13th 14th 15th amendment and 2000 african-american elected officials and 16 african-american members of the house of representatives two in the u.s senate and then how uh, and then we are starting to acquire acquire more land and then how that ends with the compromise of 1877 between uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel J. Tilden, the uh, Republican and Democratic candidates for president. And Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, agrees to remove the, the Union troops out of the South who were protecting the rights of African Americans. OK, and this brings in the Jim Crow era and then how we fight against that. And then so we have to understand that chronology of history because that that Jim Crow era where they where they you have like the mississippi uh state convention of uh 1890 and they rewrite the state constitution to oppose poll taxes and literacy tests and suppress the african-american vote in a state where we were the major we were the majority of the voters and the majority of the population in mississippi and and that became known as the mississippi plan what mississippi did and then other southern states these former confederate states started doing the same thing because they feared the power of our vote well, when we look at what's taking place today, starting with Senate Bill 201, I think it is out of Georgia and then other states copying that to uh, 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 re rewrite their uh, uh, laws, their voting laws to suppress the African-American vote. But not just the African-American vote, those are Latinos and white college students, mm -hmm. et cetera. We see this history repeating itself. So we have to understand well, hold, hold it right there because yeah. I wanna, you made me think of something that happened this week. At the U.S. Supreme Court, yeah, where they actually, you know, looked at that case from the state of Alabama because mm -hmm. they did all that, you know, hocus pocus gerrymandering uh, to suppress the black vote and um, made it so all the blacks would be the, with the redistricting, so that instead of blacks taking up two big districts, they moved it to one, right. which means 
you know, they lost the con. So that was good news for black folks. Yeah, you that, think that uh, if that will transfer to other states as well? We're, we're, we're hoping that will transfer to other states because uh, there are uh, lawsuits uh, for dealing with Louisiana and Georgia uh, that are pending lawsuits. So we're hoping the Supreme Court will rule favorably in those. Actually, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered today. That was one of the things that we talked about uh, on, on Roland show that dealt with Section two of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But see, it's right. You know, so right. all this history comes. No, I, I can. Uh, we can go back and watch that, right? Because I usually see you yeah. after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, uh, Roland Martin on YouTube or on Facebook, right. and it's on my Facebook page, Michael right. M. Hotep and the African History Network. But see, all this history comes together because the reason why you needed say this is Section Two of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The reason why you needed the 1965 Voting Rights Act is because of what happened in Mississippi in 1890. OK, with the poll taxes and the literacy test and the poll tax was a tax that you had to pay to, to register to vote. And then you have um, uh, Louisiana. They write their, they rewrite their state constitution in 1898. They impose not just poll taxes and literacy tests. They impose a grandfather clause, which was and they're coming. They're trying to come up with ways to uh, navigate around the 15th amendment to the u.s constitution was guaranteed the right to vote for african-american men the 15th amendment of 1870 so the grandfather clause stated that if your grandfather prior to 1867 could not vote most likely because he was a slave then you can't vote and in a lot of these southern states we were the majority of the population as a legacy of slavery when you look at the voter suppression that takes place in Florida right now, for instance, their, their felony disenfranchisement law, they got struck down uh, in 2018 because they put it on the ballot and over 60 percent of uh, Floridians voted to uh, remove that uh, uh, felony disenfranchisement law. So Florida was a state where if it was one of four states where if you lost your right to vote because you had a felony conviction, you lost it for life. That felony disenfranchisement law dates back to 1868, 1868, three years after slavery ended, when Florida wrote their state constitution. And uh, at this time, African-Americans were 48 percent of the state population in Florida. And they created this felony disenfranchisement law to lock many of us out of voting because they feared what they called a Negro legislature. They feared us voting and having political power. OK, so it, and we see this legacy in Florida to this to this day. All right. So we have to we'll see um, we have to understand history, economics, law and power and, and politics to really understand what's going on today and to uh, understand that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, the adoption, interpretation and enforcement. So when we have a, a shift in our mindset. And understand that we have to stop telling African Americans to exercise your right to vote. You and we need to tell them to start voting for power and power acquisition because you don't vote for exercise. If you want to exercise, you go to the gym and work out. You vote for power. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and every aspect of our life is shaped by laws and policies. So when we and but Michael, you know, I always wonder. Yeah. You know, we hear the term. Majority rules, majority rules. And you've said so many times this evening that certain states, Mississippi, other states, were, were black folks were actually the majority. But how were they, how does a majority get, you know, sidetracked or just bamboozled and, and just taken advantage of? Well, like, because like what has happened to us, how does a minority, you know, rule over a majority of people? Well, well, because uh, you had we were uh, ten, we were a few years out of slavery, uh, 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 you know, thirty-five years out of slavery, and they're still they were still making in control of a lot of the laws there in mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi. Okay, uh, whether you talk about the uh, Mississippi Department of Education, whether you talk about uh, the police, whether you talk about the police. When you talk about the the uh, uh, after 1890, uh, the state legislature. So they were able uh, to see. See, keep in mind the reason why the South wanted the Union troops taken out was because the Union troops were to a certain extent enforcing the rights of 
former slaves. Once mm -hmm. they got those Union troops removed, which was what was bargained during the compromise of 1877 uh, between the Democrats and Republicans, because neither Samuel J. Tilden or Rutherford B. Hayes had enough electoral college votes to become president. So the Democrats said, OK, we'll let Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, become president if you remove the Union troops out of the South, because that allowed the, 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 the white supremacists in the South to take back control of all levels of government in the South and do what they wanted. OK, even though in many of those states, we were the majority of the population. All right. OK, so, we're going to hold it right there because we're going to take a break. And then do you mind talking a little bit about, uh, you know, what happened this week? <laughs> What's in the news right now? And right. where is this going to take us? Because, you know, the next election cycle is going to be so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, either things will get better or, as I say, you know, we're, we're doomed. Right. I mean, you know, it's. We're living in very fearful times right now Absolutely. Uh, with people that are in elected office in high positions that don't seem to know their, you know, their elbow from a hole in the ground. Right. Um, you know, just a lot of incompetence, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that when we come back with Michael M. Hotep. Don't go away. Stand by, everybody. Back from break, stand by. All right, um, back from break in four minutes. All right, stand by. Back from break in three minutes. Okay, who still needs to register for uh, my new 12 week online class? It starts up Sunday, uh, June 18th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, you can register for it at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Stand by. Stand by, be right back.
And of course, the business that we're minding tonight is all about Juneteenth. And I also, we want to talk uh, with Michael M. Hotep. He's, on, he's my 9th colleague here. And we're going to talk about some of the things that happened this week politically. You know what I'm talking about. And how is this going to affect black people in America? What, what's your take, Michael? Uh, you're talking about the indictment of Donald Trump? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Because we talked about this um, last um, Friday on um, Willa Martin and Filter, and I talked about it Sunday mm-hmm. on my show. So I read through a lot of the uh, indictment. Okay, it's devastating. Um, it's it's good that this is happening. It's good that Donald Trump is being uh, uh, held accountable in criminal court, federal criminal court. Uh, no man or woman is above the law. And if he had just given um, the classified documents, over 300 classified documents back uh, in uh, like May of 2021, when the National Archives first asked for them, he wouldn't be in this predicament now. But he- Right. And that's why people keep saying, well, Biden had documents and tempted. But when they asked for them back, they complied. Well, That's the well, difference. Well, with uh, with Biden, his attorneys discovered the documents and they contacted the National Archives and turned them over. The National Archives did not know the documents were missing. Then with, with, with Biden, after Biden, but with Trump, Biden, they had to actually go in there and you know and and just push their way in the place and uh, and take them because he refused to. Get, in fact, didn't he ask one of his lawyers? He said. Can't we just say they don't exist and we don't have them? Well, that that came out. That was, uh, I believe that's a recording uh, that one of his uh, uh, attorneys made. But uh, keep in mind, there was um, in August of 2022 when they served a search warrant uh, of uh, Mar-a-Lago. That was, uh, they, they recovered 102 documents then, okay? They had already mm-hmm. recovered uh, over 100 documents uh, earlier or, or um, early in the year. OK. And there, there was a, a period where 38 documents were recovered and uh, his attorney uh, signed off on one of his attorneys uh, signed off on the document saying that these were all of them. And the National Archives went back and checked and said, no, we still think you had some. So. Uh, Trump is being is important. People understand Donald Trump is being hit with 31 counts of the Espionage Act, violating the Espionage, espionage Act of 1970. <laughs> uh, and you know, I haven't heard espionage since the last James Bond movie. You know, you hear espionage, that's serious. Yeah, Espionage Act of uh, 1917, uh, during World War One is when it came into existence, uh, uh, signed into law. Uh, five counts of uh, willfully withholding documents and records so is obstruction of justice and then also one count of uh making false statements to the fbi which which is a felony okay so if he had just turned these documents over and didn't obstruct justice didn't delay 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 um uh, he would not be in this predicament right now but that's his behavior so his his actions are catching up with him. So this is uh, this is good for America. Now for for African Americans, it's important to understand that uh, the 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 policies that Republicans are pushing, generally speaking, are not beneficial to African Americans, and they keep overwhelmingly voting, or they are against policies that are beneficial to us. When we talk about student loan forgiveness and executive order that President Joe Biden signed. 
dealing with student loan forgiveness. It's going to move 500,000 African-American families from a negative net worth to a positive net worth. It's going to discharge student loan debt uh, completely for a little more than 25% of African-Americans. It's, it's going to have a huge impact. Well, Republicans don't support this. You have Republicans that file lawsuits to uh, to block this. Uh, you just had uh, Republicans who wanted to, um, uh, d d during the debt ceiling uh, negotiations, they wanted to really overturn or weaken uh, what Biden did when it came to debt forgiveness. When we look mm -hmm. at uh, things like the uh, George Floyd Justice and Police in that, for instance, okay, or we look at police reform. Republicans are largely against something like that. That that bill passed the House of Representatives in March of 2021 by a vote of 220 to 212. All the Republicans voted against the bill, even though they said how terrible it was what happened to George Floyd, and they sat up there and they were crying and things like this. When it came time to actually do something about it, they they voted against the bill, and it was Senator Tim Scott in the Senate, the Black Republican. From South Carolina, oh yeah, he's the one who blocked the who he's the one who blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the Senate when they had the negotiations between Senator Tim Scott and Senator Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey, mm -hmm. and Representative right. Karen Bass uh, uh, from California. They were negotiating what the Senate version was going to look like. Senator Tim Scott was the one that blocked that bill, and he wants to be president. Well, he's he running for president, president because. Tim Scott is doing the bidding of white supremacy. This is why Tim Scott doesn't think systemic racism exists. When he was on The View and they... they uh, I saw it. I saw it. He stood so, up, so you know, he, and he, he, it he, got heated. So, well, it got heated because they they didn't properly define what it was they were talking about. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, privileges, benefits, land, access to education, access to opportunity, health care, marketing, jobs, etc. And they use that to marginalize, subordinate, do harm to another race of people. The game that black Republicans play is talk to them by white Republicans, white conservatives. So they may say, well, racism exists, but systemic racism doesn't, doesn't exist. Racism is systemic by nature. What they try to do is reduce it down to the individual. So Senator Tim Scott said his success going from cotton to Congress in one generation proves that racism doesn't exist. No, it doesn't, because you have a you have an eight to one racial wealth gap, median household wealth. OK, that the white people don't have eight times the wealth of African-Americans because they worked eight times harder. That's a result of a legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation. That's a, the the, uh, the redlining system, 1937, the GI Bill, 1944, uh, the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts of 52 and 56 that drove 41,000 miles of interstate highways throughout this country, like through Black Bottom, where I-375 went through and knocked out 300 businesses, yeah. knocked out homes that we own. That's a consequence of the laws and policies of this country. The Homestead Act of 1862 that gave away 270 million acres of land for 124 years from 1862 to 1976 that was federal policy that's what creates the uh, the, the the structural inequities okay so because you because you point to your own success that doesn't eradicate the system but this is the game that the black republicans play because if they admit that systemic racism exists then th the next logical question would be well what are you going to do about it they don't have any policies to deal with it so they want to pretend like it doesn't exist and the white conservatives the white republicans republicans won't let them deal with it do you think that tim scott is in this presidential race because his party wanted him in there to have a black face to perhaps attract more black people to consider voting that, for that, the GOP, I, or does he really think he stands a chance, which he does not? No, no, he doesn't stand a chance, but I'm not convinced that Donald Trump is going to get the nomination either because Fonnie Willis in probably second or third week of August, she's going to file charges as well. He's going to be indicted in there. Uh, Jack Smith, special counsel Jack Smith, is going to file charges in the January 6th insurrection. He's going to uh, deal with that as well. So he's going to be dealing with four different indictments. OK, so, but, so, so so you're talking about more federal indictments, right? No, because no, we know Georgia, there may Georgia be more state Georgia indictments in Georgia, but Georgia's the federal local. indictments are the ones that could devastate him. Yeah, but Georgia could devastate him. Georgia could devastate him as well. Uh, 
And the thing is, is that uh, I'm not convinced Donald Trump is going to get the nomination. I think uh, when all is said and done and all this information comes out, especially uh, it, it, all this comes out, I think Mike Pence uh, could very well end up with the nomination. And if Mike Pence, uh, who has experience as vice president, he has more experience with foreign policy, more experience running the government than anybody else running besides Donald Trump. But Donald Trump really didn't didn't know what he was doing. Expect Mike Pence to either have Tim Scott as his running mate to attract African-Americans and go up against Vice President Kamala Harris or Nikki Haley, who's a woman of color. She's of Indian descent and she was the former governor of South Carolina because they because they're going to realize they can't have another old white man uh, running with Pence. OK, that's not going to work. Right. Right. OK. Right. If you want to. Well, I don't you know, I, I, I don't uh, the whole that whole lot of them. I, I'm not impressed with anybody, really. You know, Pence, um, you know, mm -hmm. but, he might be uh, more qualified than the rest of them. But yeah, I still don't. You know, I, I don't know if he could. I don't know if he could win a general well, well, election. Well, well some of I them are know. starting to change I, their tune now that they started reading the indictment. So Pence just said in the past right. couple of days that he can't excuse these allegations. There's no way he can excuse. It. That's different than what he said. That's right. When That's right. And Nikki Haley said if she wins, she would pardon him. We're going to take our last break. So hang in there. We'll we'll take a quick break and come right back and wrap up. Stay tuned to Mind Your Business with Charlene Mitchell. We'll be right back. Hey, Detroit, listen up. Debo has got an unforgettable Juneteenth celebration on June 17th from noon to 6 p.m. at Grand River in Livernoy. And believe us when we say you won't want to miss it. There are going to be tons of family-friendly activities. We're talking face paint, bounce houses, hustle lessons, bingo, space, food trucks, and much more. But that's not all. They've got a DJ and live performance by the Oma Wale dancer, Amor Shane, and three... from breaking four minutes. Back from breaking two minutes. In the first round, 2016 U.S. Open champ Dustin Johnson and Wyndham Clark, six under, two back. I'm Ted Emrick, Westwood One Sports. At Granger, we're for the ones who pay attention to every little detail. Back from breaking one minute.
in history. He's my go-to guy. Well, he's a lot of people's go-to guy. <laughs> when people want an expert to talk about uh, these kind of issues, we start out talking about Juneteenth, right. and uh, but when we kind of segue to uh, you know the news of the day, the news of the week, which is the 37 count indictment of Donald Trump. Right. Um, if you had a crystal ball. What are your predictions? You kind of hinted at it mm-hmm. a little bit, uh, saying that uh, you think that he may not be the nominee. You think that the GOP is saying one thing in front of the cameras, but maybe they have another discussion going on behind closed doors? Oh, they're saying things behind closed doors. They know they know he's guilty, but a lot of them are, are afraid of Michael. Him. Can you hear me? Can hello? You hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I'm talking. Can you hear me? Testing, testing, testing. I do not know what happened. Okay, I can hear My you. My board op just left the room. If okay, you're a listener you. listening to us right okay, now, okay, I expect to be back on. Um, I don't know if my... Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, Charlie. Uh, my guest is talking, and maybe I just can't hear him. Yeah, so... so or if he's gone. Yeah, no, I'm here. Uh, I see, see him still on the board, which means he's he's attached, but I don't hear anything. And my engineer just left the, the uh, studio. He should be coming back in here. So we're just going to sit here and wait. Yeah. So if you have any comments to make, if you can even hear me right now, our number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600. And uh, we are talking about the indictment of Donald Trump, um, all these Republicans that are running for president, and, um, you know, who's going to be the, he's the front runner right now. But with all these charges against him, will people still support him? Or will some of the yeah. people kind Charlie, of maybe move him. away from him, even if they've supported him in the past? That's what we're discussing. That's what we want to know. Because it's really, we're in a kind of a conundrum right now. Um, because the MAGA uh, Republicans and then the more, I guess, middle-of-the-road Republicans are not really uh, meeting head-to-head on what their views are. And the Democrats, I hope, will um, will sit back and, and, and watch and, and act accordingly, because who knows? Can you hear me? I mean, right now, um, President Biden would, would be the nominee, because that's what usually happens, and he says he's running again. So you just wonder what is going on. Uh, my board up just came back in. I don't know if the public is hearing I'm, me. I'm I cannot here. hear my guest. Since you went out, there's no sound. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Well, he's back and we're back. Yeah, I've been here the but, whole time. Um, you've been here the whole time. I, I could you hear, hear me? You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. I could not hear you, so I didn't know if you were talking. Yeah. So I just went on and on and on. Okay. We're going to use these last uh, uh, six, seven minutes to talk about what you predict, if you could really predict what's going to happen. We're assuming that Joe Biden, he says he's running again, oh, yeah. and uh, the incumbent president usually does, you know, they don't pick another nominee unless the president says, I'm not running. So assuming it's going to be Biden and Harris again, yeah. who could, it's going to be you, you kind of made some predictions. Biden's going to defeat Trump. It, okay, it, 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 I'll it was, take Biden it. Biden got 81 million votes in 2020, Trump got 74 million. It's going to be a wider gap. Biden, people are going to people are going to see. Oh, oh no! When 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 more information comes out, what's in this indictment? When 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 the indictment comes down from Jack Smith dealing with the January sixth insurrection and Donald Trump's involvement in trying to overthrow the government, people are going to realize. Oh hell no! We can't go down. We can't go down this road again. They're going to see, and you're going to have you're going to have Republicans who want to turn on him. Okay, like uh, uh, Chris Christie. Who uh, was? Oh, Trump's he called him loser, loser, loser. 2016. <laughs> he was on his transition team, and he helped with the debate prep with Trump against Hillary Clinton. Okay, now uh, he uh, Christie got what he somewhat what he wanted. He, he Christie did not get a position in the White House because Jerry. Well, he's kind of a flip flopper too, though. He is a flip flopper. Well, Jerry Kushner blocked Christie because. Chris Christie, when he was U.S. attorney from New, Jer- New Jersey, sent Jared Kushner's father to prison. Right, right. Okay, so that's why Chris Christie didn't end up in working in the White House. But you're look here, we got some, we got some gangsters up in there. You know, we got some, 
you know, you might you might not want to call them that, but you know, these are not the cleanest hands. All no, these no, people no, running for office. Trump, Trump is the Trump is the biggest gangster. Trump Trump is the oh, biggest I, gangster. And and, and yes. the thing is, is that everything, almost everything Trump does, he tells you ahead of time he's going to do it. Yeah. So people have to. And everything to everything is a witch hunt. Everything. Well, nothing is ever his fault. He's never held himself accountable for anything, right. whether it's grabbing women's private parts right. um, in that interview with uh, uh, Billy Bush, yeah. or whether it was the woman in the dressing room at Bergdorf Goodman's who yeah, just yeah, got yeah. you know the $5 million libel suit, right. and then he turned around and called her a whack job. Now she's suing him for $10 million, and I hope she gets that too. Because oh. the only, only thing that can break Trump is when you hit him in the pocketbook. No, no, no. If Trump, you, 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 if Trump is broken, if he has no money, he will not want to be on this earth. Yeah, but 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 you defeat him at the ballot box. You cannot let a crazy man like that back into power because he. Oh, I totally agree with you. I agree. So 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 you have to defeat him and his cronies at the ballot box. Okay, and and very quickly here, people should read the document that's at WhiteHouse.gov. That came out February February 27, 23, 23. It's called Fact Sheet. The Biden-Harris administration advances equity and opportunity for black Americans and communities across the country. And this document deals with, is about 36, 38 pages. And it goes through and shows how the policies from the Biden-Harris administration are helping the African-American community. Okay. Okay. But you them. talked about the, uh, the student loans. Isn't that going before the Supreme Court? Because we already know the, the GOP Court, has yeah, blocked Supreme it in the rule. Senate. Supreme Court is expected to rule any day now on that. It's already been uh, litigated and, before the Supreme Court. And that's, oh man, that could make such a difference if they rule in favor. I know one person that won't vote for it, and that's Clarence Thomas. Right, well, well yeah, that, but also uh, Congress has to, uh, in, the next, in, the next, uh, in the next Congress, it's not going to happen here, uh, the Democrats have to increase their uh, margin in the Senate and take back the House. And then you can if you, you can get 52, 53 people to uh, do a carve out to the filibuster or vote to reform the filibuster and go back to like a standing talking filibuster like it used to be like Mr. Smith goes mm -hmm. to Washington with Jimmy Stewart. Okay? Right. Because now you have right. a filibuster. The movie, right? yes. But very quickly here, uh, uh, people visit my website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, because uh, I'll, I'll be speaking um, in uh, Mount Clemens, Michigan on Friday, June 16th, uh, uh, for Juneteenth at 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., the meetup. And this is taking place at the Carnes Community Center, C A I R N S, Carnes Community Center, 58 Orchard Street, Mount Clemens, Michigan, 48043. Uh, it's a free event. We'll have the information at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I'm at the Black Urban Farm on Oakland Avenue on Saturday, uh, uh, June 17th, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then uh, Sunday night, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., the African History Network show right here at 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. And then on uh, Monday, on uh, June 19th, I'll be out in Inkster and uh, I'll be at the uh, where is this? I'll be at the uh, uh, Inkster, uh, Inkster Park, 1550 John Daly Road. Uh, that's 3 p.m. Okay. to 9 Okay. Well, they're giving me the, giving me the cutoff sign. Yeah. Uh, so, but, man, you got a lot going on, and I commend you. I admire you. I love what you do. Oh, You're a great you. teacher, and um, you're just a blessing to the black community. So oh, thank you for you. joining me tonight, and you have a good Juneteenth weekend. All right, you too. Keep teaching. Okay, Keep thanks. teaching. All right. And for everybody listening, uh, I'll be back tomorrow. All right. All right, everybody. Hey, we'll have the information at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, we have uh, the flyers on my uh, Facebook page. Uh, right now, we have them on my Facebook page. And uh, we'll get the we'll get the information there. Also, register for the uh, online classes that I teach. We have uh, class number one of uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, we have class number one uh, that starts up uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday, uh, June eighteenth. 
2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So uh, this is a class I've been teaching on and off since 2017. It's evolved immensely since 2017. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, classes on sale, uh, $80, regularly $130. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch any anytime. As soon as you register uh, this archive content, you can start watching. You get free uh, five free lectures of mine also that, that are uploaded to the video library. But a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. You don't have to be present in class. You don't have to worry about being in class at a certain time, anything like that. OK, so visit our website. The African History Network dot com, the African History Network dot com. Um, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And uh, we'll post the uh, we'll post the link here uh, to register for the full course. We'll post the link right here on the thread of the broadcast and it's in the description here as well. OK. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember right now. Oh, also, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And we have the information on the homepage of our website uh, as well. Uh, the African History Network dot com. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win, we're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you next time, peace. All right, stand by. All right, we'll talk to you next time.